Mr. President, I'm here, here for um, what is number 30 in my series of scheme speeches about the scheme to uh, capture the Supreme Court, and I thought this would be a good time to give sort of a quick overview of where we've been since uh, most of my speeches have been rifle shot speeches at individual issues that the court has um, caused us to have to face up to. So the fundamental problem here is that we have a Supreme Court that has been captured by right-wing special interests. And um, we see this in decision after decision after decision and it is affecting the lives of ordinary Americans all over. When I say that this is a court that has been captured by right-wing special interests, what do I mean? Well, there is considerable research out there and considerable literature out there about a phenomenon that is sometimes called agency capture and is sometimes called regulatory capture. It's the same thing. It's the capture of regulatory agencies. And you can look it up in your library, you can look it up on the internet, and you can get a sense of uh, the extent to which this is recognized in the economic literature, recognized in the administrative law literature, um, and it is a frequent avenue, unfortunately, of corruption into government uh, decision-making. And if you want an example to think about, you could imagine a railroad commission whose job is to set rates for the railroad back in the era of the railroad barons. And the railroad barons have chosen who's on the railroad commission. So the railroad commission isn't serving the public, it's doing exactly what the railroad barons want. That, in a nutshell, is what agency or regulatory capture is all about. And one of the things that we've discovered in the course of this is that the effort to capture the court has been a very expensive effort. This is no small or casual thing. True North Research has done a lot of this research, and so far, they're up to finding $580 million that have been spent on this court capture operation. Not always easy to figure out because the money flows from one place to another through indirect sources and into entities that obscure who the original donor is. It's complicated. But $580 million is a lot of money. And even very, very, very rich right-wing billionaires aren't going to spend that much money on a whim. They're going to spend that kind of money because they're going to get a return on their $580 million investment. So that is the fundamental problem we are facing, a court captured by special interests. In the same way that in the old days, agencies and commissions were captured, but that technique jumped the rails and was applied to our Supreme Court uh, and with a very, very robust scheme behind it with at least $580 million spent to accomplish these goals. So there you go. You've got your captured court. You've spent your $580 million. But can you really expect the judges that you help put on the court to remember exactly what it is they're supposed to do in every case? No. That's pretty hard, even for very bright judges. So the next thing you have to do is figure out how you get the court to do what it's told and pass on the message of what it is that you want. You've captured a court. How are you going to tell it what the outcome is that you want? So this is a court that is doing what it's told, and the manner in which it's told is actually uh, fairly um, plain view in some respects. Let me take these down. Because 
What happens is that the dark money billionaires fund groups that file briefs. And it's not just one brief. They file briefs in little flotillas. Usually the number is 10 or 12. In a case really important to them, we've seen the number get as high as 50, but that's pretty rare. So amici curiae, Latin for friends of the court, are groups that are allowed to file briefs in the Supreme Court, even though they're not a party to the case. And um, they come in, and let's say that there are a dozen of them. They're coordinated, they send the same common message, and that way the justices who've been put on the court through this court capture scheme uh, are kept up to date on precisely what it is that their big donors want. Now, when I say fake amici, I mean that these are groups who don't very well disclose who's behind them. It doesn't say, we're here from Coke Industries, we're here from ExxonMobil. It's intermediating groups that have um, mysterious sounding names. I'll give you one example right here. This is, um, this is a group of organizations managed by a guy named Leonard Leo, who was basically the fixer, the factotum of the right-wing billionaires who spent the $580 million to capture the court. You need an organizer, you need an orchestrator, you need a guy who runs around and does the stuff, and Leonard Leo is the guy. And he has his own little group up here of companies that report to him and pay him. This is how he gets money out of the scheme. But down here, he has this array of front groups that um, he and his allies control. Um, 85 Fund and Concord Fund actually exist. They are corporate entities under Virginia corporate law. These other entities, Judicial Education Project, Honest Elections Project, Free to Learn, Free to Learn Action, Honest Elections Project Action, and the Judicial Crisis Network actually don't exist. What they are under Virginia law is fictitious names. That's the legal term for what they are. Fictitious names for these entities. So in one of the cases in which these phony front group amici appeared to tell the captured justices what it was that their donors wanted, Honest Elections Project filed the brief. It did not identify itself in its brief as being a mere fictitious name. It did not identify itself as being a mere fictitious name of this 85 fund group. It did not identify that the 85 fund group is a corporate twin to this Concord fund group. The 85 fund is what's called the 501c3 group. Concord Fund is the 501c4 group. It's customary in political influence operations to have a twinned 501c3 and 501c4, sharing office space, sharing personnel, sharing donors, sharing board members. Very hard to find a corporate veil between the two that is actually real. And what they also did not disclose is that the Honest Elections Project, as a fictitious name of the 85 fund, tied it to the Concord Fund, which operates under the fictitious name Judicial Crisis Network. And it's through this fictitious name that the billionaires spent huge amounts of money on TV advertising to stop the nomination of Judge Merrick Garland to the Supreme Court and to push for the confirmation of Justices uh, Gorsuch and then Kavanaugh and then Barrett onto the Supreme Court with individual checks written to support the campaign as big as 15 and 17 million dollars. These are serious people who are writing serious checks to try to have a serious effect on the court. And they have, but it's hidden. Judicial Crisis Network ran ads for justices who were reading Honest Elections Project briefs without explaining the connection between the two. So the whole thing is very slippery and that's why I use the word fake about it. Here's another thing about it. This is an uh, appendix 
that I added to a brief that I wrote in the Thela Law versus Consumer uh, Financial Protection uh, Board Bureau um, case. And it shows in individual entities that filed briefs, amicus briefs in that case, and it showed their funders. And if you look at it, it's basically one big blob through which billionaires send money from these entities into these entities. Donors Trust has really no purpose in life other than to hide the identity of donors. It's an identity laundering machine to give to all of these things so that the court doesn't know and the public doesn't know that in effect it's the same people behind this array of front groups. Makes it look like there are a whole bunch of different things. The New Civil Liberties Alliance and the Buckeye Institute and the Southeastern Legal Foundation, the Pacific Legal Foundation. Oh my gosh, they must be from all over the country. Eh, not so much. They're front groups for the, for the funders who run money through these outfits to prop up these outfits. So you've got your captured court and you've got your front groups to tell the captured court what it's to do and what you end up with is that these fake amici propose a whole lot of factual findings for the court and you end up with fake fact finding. And if you look at some of the worst decisions that this Supreme Court has rendered, Citizens United and Shelby County, both of them stood on fake fact finding. They asserted things to be true that were not true and those things were essential to the logic of the decision. The court couldn't have gotten to the outcome it wanted to get to without those pylons, if you will, of fake fact. And they've opened up a whole new arena for fake fact finding with the new so-called history and tradition analysis that they brought to bear on uh, Dobbs, on reproductive rights cases, and in Bruin, on gun rights cases because you can fake your way through history and tradition very easily. You just go back into history and you cherry pick the fake facts that you like. Real historians will come in and say, well, that was ridiculous, but it doesn't matter. You got what you wanted. And the ability to do that fake fact finding is gonna get worse, not better. Citizens United and Shelby County are the worst of all, and these two decisions have really hammered our democracy. Citizens United by letting unlimited amounts of dark money into our elections. We're up to a billion dollars in dark money now. Don't tell me those people are spending money just for the sake of the goodness of the country. No, they have specific things that they want out of politics and they're willing to spend a billion dollars to get them and ordinary citizens be damned. And Shelby County basically gutted the key enforcement provision of the Voting Rights Act and a flood of legislation in formerly protected states flowed through shutting down access to the ballot on behalf of uh, mostly minority voters. In fact, in one case, targeting minority voters, which the court said was surgical precision, surgical precision. So what are we doing about all that? That's a hell of a problem set. What are we doing to try to get to the bottom of it? Well, we're doing a couple of things. First, we're trying to educate the public. We're trying to let people know what's going on. This is not a normal court. This is not the way courts ordinarily behave, and this is certainly not the way the Supreme Court should be behaving. Second, we're trying to investigate. We're trying to figure out what the heck was going on. Get to the bottom of this mess. How did this happen, and uh, what are the problems? Third, we're legislating. My bill to clean up the mess that the Supreme Court has cleared the Judiciary Committee, and we are uh, hoping for a vote on that in this Congress. I doubt it will get much support on that side, but I think it's very important to have a recorded vote that shows who's on the side of the billionaires behind the court capture operation and who would like to have a little bit of clarity and transparency and have justices meet the same ethic standards that other federal judges meet. It's not a peculiar standard. It's what's required of other federal judges. So the education piece is working tolerably well, I would say, uh, and people get it. I think we're down to 18% of Americans who have uh, real confidence in the integrity of the court. And um, I've put a lot of work out there to document what is going on. 
And if anybody's interested, you can look up my name as an author in the Harvard Law and Policy Review and find my article there. You can look up my article that the American Constitution Society published. You can look up my Harvard Journal on legislation article. And you can look up uh, my Yale Law Journal article. And my most recent one was in the Ohio State Law Journal on this whole scheme of uh, fake fact-finding propping up Supreme Court cases and how they violated the rules of fact-finding in order to violate fact-finding. So uh, there's a lot of research out there. And across, these are all uh, publications that get review. They've all been cleared by the publisher. So it's not like I'm making crazy stuff up. And these have been out there in some cases for years. And everybody who wants to criticize them has had every chance. And um, they seem to have stood up very well uh, on their facts. What are we doing on investigation? Well, the Finance and Judiciary Committees are looking into the problems at the court. Uh, Chairman Wyden at the Finance Committee has developed evidence that the motor coach loan to Justice Thomas was never paid back. In fact, not a dollar of principal was ever paid on that loan. For a period of time, Justice Thomas paid interest to the individual who made the quarter of a million dollar loan to him, and then he stopped paying interest, and he never paid any principal. So we're looking into what that means. What does that mean from a point of view of Justice Thomas's disclosure about gifts and income? And what does that mean with respect to his tax filings? Because under American law, the forgiveness of a debt is income and needs to be declared. Was that done? That's what the investigation is looking to find out. The second has to do with Harlan Crow's yacht, also famous from uh, Justice Thomas's vacations. Uh, this is the yacht that took uh, Thomas around Indonesia for uh, 10 days or so in what has been valued at a quarter of a million dollar vacation. Not bad. Well, it turns out that the Crow yacht has been going around the world declaring itself to be a pleasure yacht in some places, and in other places declaring it to be a yacht for charter. Well, the difference between a pleasure yacht and a yacht for charter is that a yacht for charter gets to deduct its expenses. And sure enough, it looks like Mr. Crow has deducted $8 million, $8 million in tax deductions off what he often says and what the Boats Shell Corporation often says is just a pleasure yacht. You don't get to deduct the expense of your pleasure yacht. So it's an important distinction. They say both things, and we're investigating which is true and whether false statements were made. And then in the Judiciary Committee, under the leadership of Senator Durbin, we've had the authority to obtain subpoenas. We are able to uh, subpoena the Shell Corporation that owns the yacht. We're able to subpoena the Shell Corporation that owns the private jet. We're able to subpoena the Shell Corporation that owns the Adirondack Estate, where that famous painting was made of Harlan Crow and Justice Thomas and Leonard Leo and uh, the rest of the little crew uh, hanging out together. So that is all under active investigation, and that is not going to stop, I can assure you. As I mentioned, the uh, legislation passed the committee. Uh, it passed it on July 20 of 2023. And um, we're looking forward to having a robust discussion about Supreme Court ethics when this is brought up on the Senate floor for uh, a vote in this Congress. And um, finally, we've had an interesting set of uh, successes, I guess I'd call them at this point, with the Judicial Conference. The Judicial Conference is the body that runs the judicial branch of government. It's its own sort of board of directors. It's made up of the chief judges of all the different circuit courts of appeal and a chief judge from a district court in each circuit. It's a very august body. And here are some of the things that they've looked at. They've looked at what I call the Scalia trick. The Scalia trick was to get someone to tell a resort owner to invite Scalia on a free vacation with a personal invitation on the free vacation and then not disclose it as a gift because it was, quote, personal hospitality. Well, when that was pointed out to the Judicial Conference, they blew that scheme to smithereens because it is obvious that arranging a personal invitation to a resort owned by somebody you don't even know does not amount to the kind of personal hospitality like family trips 
that is the basis for allowing non-disclosure of, of big gifts. The question before them now is when they did that, was that a clarification of the law? Or was that a new rule? It took Scalia's lawyers about a nanosecond to jump in saying, oh, this is a new rule and we're going to comply with it. He doesn't usually talk about this stuff. So you think about why did he, why did the lawyers pop up with that? Well, the reason they popped up with that is they wanted to say that it was a new rule because if it was a clarification, which is what the Judicial Conference said it was, they'd have to go back and amend all of his previous filings that were filed in violation. That would be a fine mess. And so uh, Justice Thomas um, has a lot at stake in that determination, and that determination is before the Judicial Conference right now. They're looking at this problem of fake amici that I described. They have agreed that the rule is inadequate and that it is not appropriate for parties in the public not to know who's really in the courtroom, but to have these masks, these front groups, these fakes showing up without disclosing who's really behind them. They are still investigating what I call Thomas Crow 2.0, there was a first round of billionaire gifts from Harlan Crow to Justice Thomas back in sort of 2009, 2010, 2011 for yacht and jet travel. And that was investigated by the Judicial Conference and then the matter was closed. And then he went back and did it all over again. So they're still investigating the uh, Thomas gifts from Harlan Crow second round 2.0. And then I've asked them to look at something that Justice Alito did, which is to offer an opinion in the Wall Street Journal editorial page about a matter that was not only likely to come before the court, but was virtually certainly headed to the court. And he offered an opinion, which is something they say in their confirmation hearings that they're not allowed to do, but he did. And worse still, it wasn't just about some free-range topic. It was about a specific dispute, an ongoing dispute. He took sides in an ongoing dispute. And worse still, he took sides in that ongoing dispute at the behest of a lawyer on the other side in that dispute. And by the way, that lawyer represented his friend Leonard Leo, so there was a personal connection. And the gravamen of the dispute was our ability to find out about free gifts of travel to Justice Alito. So at the end of the day, his improper opinion protected himself from public scrutiny for gifts that he should not have been receiving. So all of that is before the Judicial Conference, and I want to express my appreciation to the Judicial Conference for their diligence in doing this. Obviously, this is not the way they'd like to spend their time, but the Supreme Court has not given them much choice by continuing to engage in all of this bad behavior, and it is all related, and it is all part of the scheme. And with that, I yield the floor.